In the mid-70s to early 80s, director-filmmaker Steven Spielberg's career was really taking off with a mighty bang, taking the movie industry and movie audiences by storm, making hit after hit, all of which would become classics, including Jaws, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and E.T. the Extraterrestrial. However, in between Close Encounters and Raiders of the Lost Ark, Spielberg directed another movie, one that often gets overshadowed and overlooked, that being 1941, the wacky World War II comedy starring the late and great John Belushi as Captain Wild Bill Kelso, along with other memorable characters and performances. So the big question is, a movie coming out at a time when the director is at his creative peak, starring an actor who is also at the height of their talents thanks to Saturday Night Live and Animal House, what went wrong? How did this movie become the black sheep in Spielberg's filmography? The film that not many people seem to like or even talk about, which came out at a time when the director was otherwise making immortalised classics. The movie that is regarded as Spielberg's big failure. Well, today we are going to try and find out as we look into 10 things that you didn't know about 1941. Yes, I am aware that I'm covering part of my face with a clipboard. And no, I promise that it has nothing to do with the fact that I recently had surgery to remove some wisdom teeth and now have a fat swollen face. <laughs> yes, totally not the case. <laughs> well, let's check it out. Number 10, written by the same team behind Back to the Future. Yes, believe it or not, but 1941 came from the brilliant minds behind the Back to the Future trilogy. Those being Bob Gale and Robert Zemeckis, both of whom wrote the screenplay to 1941. They would both go on to write Back to the Future, with Gale producing the classic time-travelling adventure and Zemeckis directing, along with the two following sequels. Gale claimed that he came up with the idea of 1941 over the Battle of Los Angeles, which took place in 1942, in which there was a paranoia that California may be under attack after America joined World War II in retaliation to Pearl Harbor. This fear was exacerbated when a weather balloon was spotted and resulted in a gunfight by air forces believing it to be an enemy target. The incident was labelled as a false alarm triggered by war nerves. In fact, people were so terrified that America would be attacked, army soldiers were sent to the Walt Disney Studio to protect the studios in the event of an attack. Because damn it, we have to save Dumbo! However, the fear and pandemonium wasn't entirely misplaced, as an oil refinery in Santa Barbara and an Oregon coastline would actually get attacked, which also took place in 1942. But regardless, the 1941 script was part of a collaboration Gale and Zemeckis had with Spielberg in their early days. The others were I Wanna Hold Your Hand and Use Cars, both of which Gale had written and Zemeckis had directed, with Spielberg acting as executive producer. Thanks to Use Cars and I Wanna Hold Your Hand, and to a degree 1941 not being massive hits, left Gale and Zemeckis to have reservations to getting Spielberg on board to act as producer to Back to the Future, as they didn't want everyone to think that they only made movies that were Spielberg's leftovers. The movies that he was working on that weren't hits that he himself didn't want to direct. Thankfully though, that wouldn't be the case, as Spielberg was the only person who truly believed in Back to the Future. Number 9. Original Director and Screenplay When searching for a director for 1941, upcoming talent Ivan Reitman was approached to direct the movie. Reitman had previously worked as a producer on Animal House and would go on to direct his own war-themed comedy with Stripes. But he turned 1941 down, as at the time he was too busy directing the comedy Meatballs. So naturally they went with Steven Spielberg because, come on, Jaws and Close Encounters. When word got out that Spielberg was directing a zany comedy, there was some trepidation as to whether or not comedy really is his forte, despite being a very talented director. With one of Spielberg's peers saying, Why is he doing a comedy? When has Steven ever been funny? 
Spielberg was even warned by film critic Pauline Kael that he was not going to get off easy with the critics on this one, due to making a World War II comedy after the critical and financial mega hits of Jaws and Close Encounters. Also, at one stage, comedy filmmaker extraordinaire Harold Ramis was approached to write a draft of the script, but he left the production due to creative differences with Spielberg and 1941's executive producer John Milius. And there are even claims that director Brian De Palma lent a hand with crafting some of the jokes in the movie. And if so, that's pretty cool. Number 8. Stanley Kubrick felt that 1941 shouldn't have been a comedy. It was in London, 1980, one year after the release of 1941, where on the set of The Shining, director Steven Spielberg met fellow director Stanley Kubrick, as Kubrick was filming his horror masterpiece at L Street Studio, which Spielberg was visiting as he was about to film Raiders of the Lost Ark on the same sound stages that Kubrick was using to film The Shining. In their meeting, Kubrick told Spielberg that he saw 1941 and loved it, but felt that the movie should have been a serious drama rather than a comedy, or at least marketed as a serious movie. That's particularly an interesting thing for Kubrick to say, considering he previously directed Dr. Strangelove or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb, which is also a wacky comedy about war. 1941 had become something of a John Belushi vehicle, as he was a huge rising star at the time, as well as featuring other popular rising stars of that time, including Dan Aykroyd, Tim Matheson, Treat Williams, John Candy, Nancy Allen, Mickey Rourke, along with some veteran actors, including Christopher Lee, Robert Stack, Toshiro Mifune, Dick Miller, James Kahn, and Ned Beatty. 1941 was Spielberg's attempt at the oddball, wacky comedy craze that was popular at that time, thanks to the likes of Animal House and Airplane. Only, I get the feeling that he didn't quite know how to fully go as outrageous as those movies did. 1941 feels a bit more restrained than those two. So in essence, 1941 is like Animal House meets an old war movie from the 40s, only it's directed by Spielberg. <laughs> which is pretty random when you think about it. And maybe Kubrick's wisdom was right, and that the movie would have played better off if it was a serious movie rather than a wacky comedy, as Spielberg would go on to do just that, with the World War II drama Empire of the Sun in 1987, which was superb and far better received. Number 7. A Gag from an Unmade Jaws Sequel even though 1941 was only Spielberg's fourth theatrical movie after The Sugarland Express, Jaws, and Close Encounters, fifth if you want to include the theatrical release of Duel in Europe, it seems that he wasn't afraid to parody himself and make fun of his previous work, as 1941 actually starts as a Jaws spoof, where we see a young blonde woman go skinny dipping in the ocean, just like Jaws, where thanks to her bathing happy ways, she would go on to get stuck in a pickle. Only this time it's not a shark, but a war submarine. The way the two scenes are shot are very similar, and in both scenes, our ill-fated bathers are played by Susan Backliney. What's interesting about this is one year earlier during the production of Jaws 2, a script for a third Jaws movie was written called Jaws 3, People Zero, which was to be a spoof of the Jaws franchise, completely played for laughs. And that movie was also going to feature a comical take on the skinny dipping shark attack scene at the start of Jaws. And Spielberg would have likely known about this as he was to have a guest star cameo in People Zero Jaws 3. So it's a nice idea that although the gag didn't pull off thanks to the sequel being scrapped, Spielberg would still go on to recycle the idea in his own movie. And let's not forget, this isn't the only time that Spielberg, Zemeckis and Gale would spoof the Jaws franchise, as there was that scene in Back to the Future 2 where Hill Valley 2015 is playing Jaws 19. This time it's really, really personal. <laughs> Number 6, Casting Possibilities. So as mentioned, there was tons of talent featuring in 1941, both upcoming and well-established stars, making 1941 something of a who's who with its impressive cast. However, there were some casting choices that didn't make it into the final film. For the role of Major General Stilwell, Spielberg offered the part to both Charlton Heston and John Wayne, but they both turned it down, finding the movie to be too unpatriotic. 
Wayne even urged Spielberg to not make the movie via a phone call, claiming that he found the movie to be disrespectful to those who lost their lives in Pearl Harbor. So, instead, the part went to Robert Stack, who would go on to make everyone laugh in Airplane. But incidentally, would also go on to terrify everyone with unsolved mysteries. Number 5. Filming Shenanigans 1941 was a joint production between Universal and Columbia Pictures. John Milius had organised for 1941 to be an MGM production, but Spielberg wanted to work with Columbia as they produced his previous movie, Close Encounters, and Universal as they produced Jaws. Filming took place around Los Angeles as well as North Los Angeles, and a great amount of the movie was filmed on studio sets and even featured very impressive miniatures which were filmed at Warner Brothers Studios and MGM Studios. And this was apparently one noisy shoot. I mean, yeah, in some scenes, there is a lot going on. In fact, it could be so noisy, the cast and crew couldn't hear Spielberg yelling cut. So he had to signal this gesture by firing a prop machine gun in the air. I guess there wasn't a megaphone lying around the set. Look, that's according to IMDB anyway. There are some claims that sometimes while filming, John Belushi was unavailable and couldn't show up to the set due to his partying nightlife, where he was just too tired to film during the day. But take those claims with a pinch of salt. There is also a shot where Wild Bill Kelso slides off the wing of a plane and lands on his head. This wasn't in the script, but the blunder happened for real. Spielberg kept it in the movie as he felt that it went with the absent-mindedness of the accident-prone character. It wasn't so funny for Belushi though, as due to the fall, the funny man had to spend several days in hospital. Hmm, I wonder if his head was swollen and blew up. Uh, not that I would know of course, no no no. <laughs> Number 4. Music So as with most of Spielberg's movies, the score for 1941 was composed by the truly brilliant John Williams, where he creates an upbeat march which sounds comical and adventurous, and even has an old 1940s war movie vibe about it. Just like the movie itself, Williams' score for 1941 has mainly become forgotten due to his other more mainstream works, such as Jaws, Star Wars, Superman, and of course Indiana Jones. But despite this, Spielberg still praises Williams' efforts for 1941, claiming it to be one of his favourite marches that the composer has made. If you're a fan of Williams' work, then you should check out his music for 1941. It's unlike any of his other scores, but it really captures the mood of the movie. While making 1941, Spielberg was toying with the idea of making 1941 a musical. Although there are some claims that this was just a joke done in jest. Although Spielberg would supposedly go on to say that making 1941 a musical may have helped with the movie's performance. But I don't know, people already had a hard enough time with Spielberg making a comedy. Making it a musical too may have just been too much for people to accept. Number 3. Comic Book so to help promote the movie, 1941 got a comic book, or rather, the illustrated story. Whoops, sorry, pardon me. Where on the cover, I swear they made Belushi look really ghoulish. You don't want that meeting you in a dark alley. But despite that, this illustrated book is something else. The illustrations are truly out of this world. It's really well detailed and full of colour, and captures the zaniness of the movie, almost looking like illustrations you'll see from a Mad or National Lampoon magazine. The illustrated story was published by The Heavy Metal Company, and featured an introduction by Steven Spielberg, with illustrations by Steven Bisset, who worked on the Swamp Thing comic books, and Rick Veach, who also worked on other DC comics like Aquaman and Justice League. The illustrated story is now a rare little collector's piece, which is worth an observation by curious fans, as it demonstrates just how far 1941 could have gone with its manic, off-the-wall antics. Like seriously, look at this comic. This is 1941 without any restraints. Number 2. Special Teaser Trailer 1941 had a teaser trailer, which also acted as something of a deleted scene, where we see the Kelso character giving the audience a prep talk, in what is a comical take on old 1940s war propaganda reels. The teaser trailer was directed by the movie's executive producer, John Milius. And for those who don't know, Milius also worked on the script for Dirty Harry and would go on to direct Red Dawn. 
and the trailer is funny enough and gets the point across. Speaking of promotional material, we then have the movie posters. This one just ascends into pure chaos, with Belushi looking like he's about to tell us off. And then we have this more cartoonish one, which is my favourite. And I think it was definitely inspired by the movie posters of other wacky comedies of that time. But just looking at the poster, you can tell how different 1941 was compared to other Spielberg movies when you compare it to their posters. Yeah, look, where's the cookie monster to say one of these things is not like the other when you need it? The main poster for 1941 was illustrated by David McMacken, who frequently designed album covers, including the Beatles' Real Music Movie Collection. Something that I only just found out right now exists. So, there you go. Number 1. 1941 wasn't as much of a failure as people think it was. 1941 is often labelled as Spielberg's first failure, or Spielberg's first flop. That's a tag that it seems to be stuck with. I mean, it's not known as that war comedy starring John Belushi, but rather that film that failed. And for that, I think it often gets shrugged off. At the time of its release, 1941 didn't get the best reviews, as critics felt that it was too loud, over-bloated, with too many characters, action set pieces, and not enough laughs. Basically, when Spielberg directed Jaws and Close Encounters, the standard had been set. This was a filmmaker who was going to direct big-scale epic movies, and to go from that to an oddball comedy just seemed so out of whack for critics and audiences at the time. In fact, the movie was seen as such a failure, John Belushi was supposedly seen wearing a t-shirt saying, Steven Spielberg, 1946-1941, a gag suggesting that the movie would mark the end of the director's career. Spielberg himself would admit that 1941 was a big lesson in his career, claiming it to be the product of his arrogance after the huge success of Jaws and Closest Encounters. However, despite the rumours that 1941 was a flop and a misfire in Spielberg's filmography, it actually wasn't a flop. It made nearly $95 million on a $35 million budget, and even got nominated for three Academy Awards. So this was by no stretch a failure. This was the product of Spielberg trying to cut loose and dip his hands in the comedy genre. I think the problem is the movies Spielberg made before and after 1941 were big time classics, often regarded as some of the best movies of all time, and 1941 just didn't live up to that high quality standard. But that doesn't mean it should be just shrugged off. I personally find it to be a fun exercise into an alternative style of filmmaking in Spielberg's career and what his career could have been like had 1941 been just as huge as Jaws or E.T. It's an obscure chapter in his timeline of filmmaking, and it is a fun movie full of energy and some genuinely funny moments. As mentioned, it didn't reach his usual levels of success, along with reaching the same comedy factor as other popular comedies of that time. Incidentally, Spielberg would try his hand in making another comedy many years later, with The Terminal in 2004, which, just like 1941, has gone on to become a forgotten entry. Personally, I don't think Spielberg is at his best when he's making comedies. I think his true talents lie in fun adventures and or serious movies but his humour works better when it's injected into his other movies, rather than basing his movies on the humour. So his comedy works better as a side entree to his bigger epic movies. Over the years, 1941 has received more fan appreciation, with more and more people going back and realising that it's not such a terrible movie after all. So it's time to go back and to give 1941 another viewing, and hopefully you'll see that it's in no way a terrible film, just one that had exceptionally big shoes to fill, which, sadly, it didn't quite feel them. But it still tries, and damn it, it has plenty of heart. So, for better or worse, that was my look into 1941. I say go check it out and make up your own mind, but go in observing it as its own thing without comparing it to Spielberg's other, more successful movies. Anyway, I'm Minty, and I'm off to rest my totally not swollen face. See ya!